shoot me down or else. Or else what, sir? Or else I shoot back. If I shoot either one of you down, you both lose. This guy needs an ego check. We'll see to that. So what's we'll say you put some skin in the game. What do you have in mind? Whoever gets shot down first has to do 200 push-ups. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> that's a lot of push-ups. Well, uh, they don't call it an exercise for nothing, sir. You got yourself a deal, gentlemen. Lights on. Let's turn and burn. Fanboy, you see him? Not beyond the radar up ahead. He must be somewhere behind us. We don't get fooled again. So that's a clip from Top Gun Maverick, the biggest film of the season so far. And it's coming off our post-COVID period where a lot of theaters were uh, having a hard time getting product. Movies were not grossing well. And so, you know, I'm reminded of another time when there was a pandemic where 675,000 Americans died. The government response was a disaster. People were talking about people will never go back to theaters again. And that was in 1918. And what happened was a lot of the mom and pop movie theaters were uh, had to, went belly up and the big companies like Zucor and some of these other people started buying them up. And out of that aggregation of power became the beginning of the big Hollywood studios that dominated the scene for uh, many decades. So the question that I've been asking myself is, what is going to be the change that's going to happen now with motion picture exhibition? Hi, my name is Garen Daly. I'm the director of Boston Sci-Fi, the 48th annual Boston Science Fiction Film Festival, coming up in February at the Somerville Theater. And joining us is the general manager of the Somerville Theater, Ian Judge. Ian, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So just tell everyone, if they do, don't know, what is the Somerville Theater? So Somerville Theater uh, is a community-based theater. It's a family-owned business, and it's been there for... 108 years and I've been there for 20 years and uh, it, it's a mix of art product, classic films, Hollywood films. Uh, we also have live events. We have film festivals like the Sci-Fi Film Festival. And, uh, you know, it's it, it was a, fi uh, well, it was originally a single screen. Uh, it was a five screen for the last 20 years. And then during the pandemic, we shifted and it's now a three screen. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really... Uh, popular and trendy part of the Boston area, Somerville, Davis Square. It's right on the subway line. A lot of students. Um, you know, it's an expensive real estate area, just like a lot of the coastal cities. Um, so, yeah, that is the theater. Uh, yeah, and we know it well, and we love going there. And every year we've been having a great time. And joining us, a newbie for us, is John Fitzgerald, uh, who I started reading his blogs. And uh, John, tell people a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, I, I guess just to put it into context, since since you run a festival, my my uh, early days uh, was a co-founder of the Slam Dance Film Festival, uh, then ran AFI in Santa Barbara and Naples and a few others. So I, I've been in the festival game a while, but uh, also uh, have made a half a dozen documentaries and um, have a company now called iGems TV, which which stands for Internet Guide to Engaging Movies and Series. And like like you all, I'm sure. Uh, we, we created this because there was a, a problem of trying to figure out what to find and where to find it online. So, so that's kind of what I spend most of my days doing now, other than helping filmmakers plan their festival strategies. Well, you know, let's, let's jump off on that. Um, you, you indicated that it's, it's tough to find film. Is that, is that, is, did I read that right? That there's a lot, there's a dearth of product out there? Well, I, I think primarily with the streaming platforms, right? You've got thousands of movies on, on Amazon, thousands more on iTunes and Netflix and Hulu and on down to a hundred plus other platforms. And I think what we've seen the last few years, pandemic aside, was people were struggling spending an average of 15 to 20 minutes in front of their screen with the remote trying to figure out what the hell to watch. So iGems was created to essentially curate and, and help people whittle down and find the quality content and essentially aggregate and be a portal and guide them to these different platforms based on their on their preferences how's it going for you are, are you starting oh, great to the company was actually uh, acquired by another company in december so i'm I, I now have a parent 
but I'm still running it as the founder and CEO. And and we just launched our app last week, so it'll be exciting to see. So, uh, so John, I think it's working. So you made some money. Uh, kind of, sorta. Well, it's an equity. It's a. It's mostly an equity play. So you know, when when the stock market's in the tank, it doesn't really help. It's a publicly traded company. So uh, I have made some money, but it was more about just having stability and and a parent company that can help really elevate us and give us the marketing muscle that we needed and help us build the app, et cetera. Hey, so, if you're not if you're not losing money, you're ahead of the game. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Definitely uh, ahead of the game. Yeah. Ian, you, you mentioned that, you know, the Somerville went from five screens to three screens. And, you know, you, we've talked about this in the past. I think it's a great thing. But could you explain what the rationale behind all that was? Sure. Well, I mean, on one level, it was simple logistics. Um, we had renovated three of our screens and there were two left to do. And then the pandemic hit. And so the question was, do we do them over or do we do we kind of roll with it and see where this industry is going into us? Uh, we don't believe movie theaters are going anywhere. We think they'll still be around uh, maybe a different form or different number, but there is a 100% going to be a shift in how movies are distributed. There already is and the pandemic hastened that. And so there's obviously going to be less movies in theaters and they're going to spend less time in theaters. So we thought, okay, the extra two screens had been built within an old ballroom, which I know you're familiar with, Garen, since you ran the joint years ago. And uh, we thought, we'll take the screens out and we'll rebuild the ballroom, which will be a flexible space so it can screen some films, maybe not commercial films, but uh, film festival films, but also serve as an event space, a community space, a wedding space. Um, and so we thought the, the more flexible we are, the better position it will be. And I mean, if we didn't have faith in movie theaters, we, we wouldn't continue to, to operate them, but we, we did feel there was a shift and we had to roll with it. And I think being able to roll with that is why the theater has managed to be around for over a century. And I think that's kind of, we can get into that, but I think that's kind of key in how theaters survive these type of things. Being flexible and adapting to the change. Yeah. That would yeah, you um, have to be able to pivot. Yes. So, so uh, is the Crystal Ballroom being successful for you? It is. It is. It, it, you know, I mean, we opened still during a pandemic, although obviously quite a, a, a different pandemic than two years ago. But it is it has started to, to gain steam and uh, we, we're doing far better than we have any right to for a, a new venue, essentially. Um, so we're, we're pleased with it. It's heading in the right direction and uh, we feel good about the choice. Um. Literally today, I got my copy of uh, Variety in the mail, and one of the articles in, in it was uh, that the summer is going to be not as good as the beginning of the summer in terms of grosses for mainstream Hollywood films. What is the state of product for movie theaters as you see it right now, John? Well, I, I think the sad truth is that, um, you know, we've seen for the last five or six years, you know, this this kind of elevation of 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 the you know the event picture if you will and and studios spending an average of a hundred million dollars to promote them and these are the movies that are driving the box office and you know for maverick for example to do what is it 1.2 billion dollars or something now um you know they spent a ton of money to market that movie and i think what you're seeing is uh two issues one is you're seeing most of these screens taken up by you know the marvel and dc and and big event pictures and Pixar movies that, that target the, the youth communities. But the other thing that's an issue is the pandemic has affected the older set, right? And especially with art house theaters, I'm sure Ian can attest to this, you know, we just did a festival in Los Angeles a few weeks ago, and it was hard to get the, the, the art house crowd to come out in droves. And I think, frankly, it's, it's a slightly older demo. And that's the demo that is less excited about jumping back into movie theaters. And I don't know what's happening on the East Coast, but I can say that COVID cases here on the West Coast in, in California has quadrupled in the last month. So so even though we started seeing people to go back to theaters and certainly they'll make exceptions for the, you know, the Mavericks, we're, we're really hurting, I think, in the art house crowd because some of these movies, quite honestly, the, the, the folks are just saying, you know what, I'll just, I think I'll just see that at home. And that's you a know, problem. I think I think the one exception to that was everything everywhere all at once. And here's a clip of that. 
This is Wang. This is Wang. Mrs. Wang, are you with us? I am paying attention. Now, you may only see a pile of receipts, but I see a story. I can see where this story is going. It does not look good. And to just sort of echo that question, question, Ian, what is happening? Is this the only film that is going to be able to do any kind of numbers for the art house crowd? And is, is, as I understand it, the demographic was a much younger audience in contrast to what John was just talking about. Yeah, 100 percent. It's an art house picture and it is a very young skewing picture. And that's great in, in some regards, because especially for me, because there's a lot of young people around my theater. But um, <laughs> you know, college kids and so forth. And A24, they just, they've, they're in a, a, a zone right now where they're, a lot of their pictures are hitting like that. They really are good at marketing them. They, they kind of know their audience. Um, so it, it, it gave a, a big vitamin B shot for a lot of art house theaters. But John is absolutely correct. That is doing nothing for the people who are staying at home. And you, you do need the equivalent of that to get them out. Like the way that Maverick really was so good by word of mouth and popular that it got people out of their houses and they went to the movies and they realized, oh, I didn't die going to the movies. It was fun. I remember that. It's fun. There needs to be something like that for the older art house crowd. And there isn't yet. There's not a there's no cohesive hit on the horizon. It's just a lot of little I like to use baseball analogy. There's a lot of little yeah. uh, bunts, bunts, singles and singles. doubles. Yeah, there's yeah. there's been no grand slams and, and uh, no home runs, you know. Um yeah, and, and I think and that the important killed. thing too here to remember, guys, is that you know we could. I just did a webinar yesterday about distribution, and we were talking about platform releases and how they've all but died. There's very few of them now, and that really hurts the art house theaters, right? Yeah. But the truth is, uh, singles and doubles are okay for some of these smaller films. I finally got out to see uh, Marcel the show with shoes on last night, and it was awesome. But there are only five people in the theater, you know. So it, it, there's some there's some there's some highlights, but we, we got to remember that we can't we can't point to just the, the everything everywheres and think, you know, this is how it's going to be. That was that was an exception to the rule of that movie. And that movie hit on every front. Right. It buzz yeah. title. Critics loved it. It was youth. It pushes the envelope in every single. I mean, it just got to throw the metaverse term in there. Right. So they did everything right. So, you know, one of the. Ian knows this about me. I'm, I, I tend to, I, I like to think of myself as an old time showman. And when I'm looking at the art houses, uh, I'm seeing not mismanagement, but I'm seeing stuff that's, you know, they're really kind of sticking to the same old, same old. Whereas the Somerville went out and, and did something bold with creating the Crystal Ballroom. I mean, are we going to see the art houses go into that nonprofit mode where 30 to 40 percent of the revenues that they're going to survive on comes from donations from people who love them? I mean, I know the Coach Corner is a nonprofit. The Brattle is a nonprofit. These are all theaters in, in the Boston area. I mean, Ian, do you think that the they that these houses are going to have to go nonprofit? I think a lot of the smaller ones are, yeah. I mean, look at Landmark is the most dominant art chain, and Cohen bought them, right? Cohen Media bought them just before the pandemic hit, and so you know they've got resources, but most of them don't. And a lot of them are already nonprofits. I think a lot of them are, are going to turn that way. I mean, uh, locally, the West Newton just announced they've sold their property and they're considering turning themselves into a nonprofit in order to maintain some kind of presence there. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's an option and in some ways, okay, maybe it's the, it's a little bit more of a, a European model where things that are related to the arts are going to be subsidized. Now, maybe it's not subsidized by the government per se, but it's subsidized by donors and things like that. I mean, as I said, I don't think movie theaters are going away, but if communities feel that these are important things, which I think everybody in this conversation probably thinks they are, 
uh, then they need to support them in some way. And if they're not going to support them by buying tickets to the movies, perhaps they'll support them through donations. Even our business, which is a for-profit family business, uh, during the pandemic, we sold hundreds and hundreds of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, hundreds of dollars of gift cards because people just wanted to support us, you know? And there is a lot of that goodwill. Unfortunately, unless it's tax deductible, there's going to be a limit to it, I think, for sure. Yeah, well, I, I think you, you, you touched on an interesting idea uh, because I think, you know, I'm, I come from the film festival space, right? And I think that there is something to be said for what some theaters are trying to do, even in the, in the bigger chain families, is they're trying to create a more full experience. And they're, you know, they're adding bars and food service, and they're trying to create more of, a, of, of an experience out of going to the movies. And I think some of those ideas are more challenging for the independent theaters, the mom and pop, you know, we, we saw a lot of them go under during the pandemic. And I think what, what I believe, again, wearing the festival hat is how do you create more unique experiences for the, for the moviegoers, right? That makes it more fun than just, you know, paying for your ticket and grabbing some popcorn. You know, do you have more Q and A's? Do you have more festivals? Do you, do you do more unique experiences. I, I, I think that's going to be critical. And, and to your point on the foundation side, you know, the American Cinema Tech was, was, a, was a, you know, a, a player here for many, many years. They're still going, but they sold one of their theaters in Netflix. You know, I don't know if you knew that, but the Egyptian now is, is kind of a yeah. joint venture situation here. Yeah. That says but, a lot but, about kind but, of where but, things but, are headed, right? It's a very strange dynamic. My read on the Netflix buy, was that Netflix needed to make some sort of sop to the regular industry. And they thought that this is also a way for them to play their product in Los Angeles and be, and, and to be able to get more Academy Award nominations and stuff like that. Yeah, and they, they, bought, they bought one in New York too. Yeah, right? the Paris, they have, yeah. they have one in New York and, and now they can, you know, stick their movies in there whenever they want. They don't have to wait around. And yeah, it, it's definitely a, a ploy. <laughs> but is it, but it, and again, the, the Netflix things, they literally just lost a million subscribers. That was the big number that they were throwing out there. I mean, and they're now rethinking what they're doing. And it looks like they're going to start sending out films to theaters, but with short windows. Is, is, that, is that correct? It's correct, but it's, it's correct, but it's, it, it it's definitely a, a a, a small, a small piece of the pie for them. I think at the end of the day, you know, they, there were, there were forecasts that they were going to lose 2 million subscribers. Right. So they got hit really hard, laid off a ton of people, their market cap went way down and then they ended up exceeding their, their expectations for the next quarter. So I, you know, I don't think they're going anywhere soon. And I think, you know, I think Toronto just announced that they're opening with a Netflix movie. So they are they are still in the game for sure, but I I just think it's interesting to see how they're playing with movie theaters now. I, I think mean, that's too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that they're they're realizing as a lot of the majors do that even if you're not making a lot of money off a of theatrical, it's a marketing tool. It defines your your product as a movie, and it doesn't get lost in the shuffle of television or streaming, or it just makes it more of an event. And I mean, if that's if they, and if theaters can, I have no problem playing something for a week or two and then it going out to, to streaming because uh, it, it's fine. And most movies are only lasting a couple of weeks anyway with decent grosses. You know, I, the fact that these big chains uh, wouldn't work with Netflix, you know, we play we've played video on demand day and date. Uh, not that there's a ton of titles available for years. I mean, Snowpiercer played for three months at our theater, did great, uh -huh. and it was on video on demand the whole time. You know, Roma, uh, Irishman. I mean, it, 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 if it's an experience worth having in the theater, the theaters can make money off of it, and the streamers might as well take the revenue and make people know that this is an important thing to see. Our, our, our exhibit is going to end up going with, you know, look, looking and doing some specialized product. I mean, like, for instance, I'm thinking about 2000 Mules, which was an abysmal film by an abysmal director. And I can't say enough bad about it. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the fact that it sold to a very specific market of troglodytes. Um, again, my, 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 my opinion of this is rather, you know, tepid. Um, but, you know, and then also the things like 
you know, the Fathom things, the opera, the Met opera. But for example, here's a, here's a clip from the, the Fathom people. I'm a huge fan of this whole event thing. I just have to say, I, I, th I mean, not, not to take anything away from, 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 you know, what theaters do with first run movies, but to me, as a, wearing my independent filmmaker hat, I feel like this is a, this is an opportunity, whether it's fathom, it was, it was tug and gather, and there's a few others, filmocracy is going to start doing it. I think that as an independent filmmaker, it doesn't always make sense to put your movie into a theater and play three or four times a day for seven days. You just don't have that big of an audience. Certainly not in, a, as num in the same number of cities as, as as Fathom can book for you. So if you can gear all your marketing up to one event one night, everybody got, makes money. You got seats, and, and whether it's going to be worthwhile, is, isn't that? Isn't it all about seats and getting tickets sold? Yeah, but if you're gear, if you think about it, if you're gearing up all your marketing towards an event playing at seven o'clock on the thirtieth, and you could see it over. 25 or 125 screens and everybody that's interested in that subject can go and see it at their at their local theater wherever they are i mean that's a model that makes sense and, and you mentioned fathom spirit of the marathon years ago that did i think over a million dollars they did it once it did over half a million they said let's just do it again in three weeks they advertised in running magazines fathom played it on you know whatever two three hundred theaters bang made a ton of money everybody was interested in that movie got to see it at the same time so the movie'd have to sit in a theater for a week in one city you yeah, know what i mean I it just it makes sense i think the flexibility of, of events like like that um fathom or non-fathom stuff is, is an advantage i mean the, the disadvantage to studios is that they're very rigid even now with windows collapsing they still won't let you split pictures or you know i mean uh, you have to play them this many times a day or this many days a week i mean it's still an argument all the time and you're paying up the nose for some of these pictures i mean at uh, nine weeks later i'm still paying the same percentage for maverick as i was in may so you know <laughs> th there's but these event things there's 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 a duality to them which is you, you get people in who might not go there and then they get exposed to your marketing for other stuff and then, like you're saying, it, it, it's it's you don't need to have it four times a day for a week. You can have that one night and make money off. Everybody makes money off it. I mean, we don't use Fathom. We're in we're in independent, and Fathom is a little bit too onerous for us. And there's some competitive issues there. Um, but and, and I have some issues with Fathom in that they will block us from booking classic movies if they're showing them things like that. But I, I like the idea of it. And a lot of the special events that we do, whether it's repertory films or concerts, we actually have live concerts or film festivals. That is one, it's fun. Two, it generally brings in people who might not have gone to your theater otherwise, and maybe they'll come back if they have a good experience. And three, you make money off of it. I mean, that's that's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, I mean, if an independent filmmaker came to you, Ian, and said and said, look, I've got this movie and I've got a marketing budget. I'm going to play it in 10 cities and you've got a great theater. Let's do this. And they'll do a revenue split with you and, and you come up with a creative. I, I mean, it's it's kind of a no brainer, right? You just take a yeah, Tuesday, I mean, Wednesday, well, Wednesday night slot and everybody yeah. wins. Yeah, it does. Uh, Ian, you mentioned clearances before. Have clearances, first of all, could you define clearances for us? And also has, has that policy been altered at all by the post-COVID period? Sure. So for those that don't know, clearances are when one theater or theater chain blocks another nearby competitor from booking a movie. And so, you know, we had to deal with that for years. If, if, if Landmark was playing a picture, we couldn't play it till they were done. Even if they were only playing it one time a day and we wanted to play it five times a day, the distributor would, you know, respect that clearance that Landmark had over us. And before the pandemic, even we had cleared all, most of those things up. Um, but the thing that has changed with the pandemic is they, they don't, I don't think they're paying, at least in our market, I can't speak to all markets. They're not paying attention to that type of stuff at all. I think so many theaters 
will just play this product. Now, you know, you talked earlier, like art house movie theaters that are playing Maverick and things like that. <laughs> I mean, they just want to get their product out there and get money and the theaters just want products. So it hasn't been as much of an issue for us. For, for us, and I suspect for a lot of other theaters, big and small, it's the, the policies and the pricing that the studios put on you that is the difficult part. So saying that, well, you can still play Top Gun next week, but you have to play it clean, which means it it gets its own screen all day. You can't put a kid's movie with it in the afternoon and play it at night. And then, you know, you're paying 62% or whatever it is, the same that you paid the first week. Um, you know, I mean, we've in the past, we've dropped movies for that. You know, uh, oh, you want to hold this Marvel o- movie over for another week? Well, you're going to pay 62%. Well, that's fine. I'll drop it and I'll bring in another movie. I'll pay 40% on, <laughs> you know, I mean, so those are to me are bigger issues. And it, it's, it's amazing to me that after all this and all the, the theaters that have gone under and the flexibility with windows, which again, we really haven't had a problem with, I don't mind windows getting smaller that they we still are not flexible on terms like that. You know, I mean, the payment terms and, all, all those, uh, whether you can split it and all that. I mean, that is, they are still SOBs about it. I don't know how else to say it, you know? Uh, is, it, is it because they're just big corporations that don't know how to move with the times? The yeah, I, I, I mean, they, I, they, they can't, I, I yeah, they can't adjust. Yeah, and I also think it's because, you know, it's, it's their party, man. Like, it's their product. Um, so they still have that attitude, even though we're the ones making a lot of their money for it. And I think they've started to realize that they, they do enjoy the revenue and need the revenue from theaters. Um, but it's still their party. You know, one of the, I want to go back to, to the fathom thing again. Um, one of the things I dislike about fathom and you kind of mentioned it, Ian is, uh, I mean, I cut my bones as a repertory art house booker. You know, I would double double features, all that kind of stuff. And they've kind of absconded with that thing after the market kind of dried up with DVDs and Blu-rays and stuff like that. And so I, I hold, I mean, Ian, tell me about, I mean, do, do you dislike the fact that they are taking films and making them events that you normally would be your bread and butter? I, I don't just like that they do it. I just like that they prevent other theaters from doing it. I'll give you a perfect example of this is that Look, one of the reasons that everybody still knows who Humphrey Bogart is is because of the Brattle Theater. I mean, they that's where the cult of Bogart was really reborn or born in the in the 50s and 60s. And for for decades, the Brattle has played Casablanca on Valentine's Day. I mean, it's just a tradition until Fathom wanted to book it around that period. And then the Brattle couldn't book it because it was it was being, you know, held for for Fathom. And Fathom played it in all the AMCs and all the showcase cinemas and yada, yada. And the Brattle had to show something else. And they had to show Casablanca a few months later. Well, you kind of want to say, screw you, Fathom. You wouldn't have a Casablanca to make hundreds of thousands of dollars off of if it wasn't for people like you, Garen, or theaters like the, the Brattle that kept those as part of the cultural zeitgeist for decades. And so that's what really bothers me. I don't begrudge them that they show them too but to step in and say you can't do it while we do it when when our theaters are the ones that created exactly what they're doing that is really frustrating it is frustrating and i love the fact you brought that up because we do have a clip from casablanca and hear that clip. <laughs> the plane's in lisbon you would like to be on it why what's in lisbon Clipper to America. I've often speculated on why you don't return to America. Did you abscond with the church funds? Did you run off with the senator's wife? I like to think that you killed a man. It's the romantic in me. It's a combination of all three. And what in heaven's name brought you to Casablanca? My health. I came to Casablanca for the waters. The waters? What waters? We're in the desert. I was misinformed. Hmm. So maybe Fathom is just simply misinformed. <laughs> I, that has well, you, got, you know, one thing, one thing that you, you that we have to make clear, it, it may have kind of come up in a backhanded way, but I want to be really clear about it. I, I, I understand what Fathom does. I understand their business, but you know, it's a joint venture owned by theaters, right? It's, so you got AMC, Cinemark, and Regal are all part of that whole package. 
So that's part of the twisted, the twisted dynamic, but, but it's the event idea wearing an independent filmmaker hat that makes sense for a lot of independent filmmakers. Cause as we all know, whether you're doing repertory or you're doing an anniversary screening or bringing back Casablanca, it's it, 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 for an independent filmmaker to have to cough up five, 10, $20,000 to release a movie for a few weeks in a, in a, in a metropolitan area and actually succeed is really hard. So, yeah. so doing an event release without fathom, I'm not saying you need to use fathom, but the idea of an event release actually makes a lot more sense for, for most of these movies. Absolutely. And it's almost like the, the old fashioned traveling road shows of a hundred yeah. years ago. So Definitely. Um, what is the future of our houses? Are they going to survive? They're going to yes, survive. No. There's going to be less of them. But go ahead, Ian. You're, yeah, you're no, the master. So. You, <laughs> uh, master of none. Um, I think that <laughs> you're right. There are going to be. They're going to survive. There's going to be less of them. We're still. We're still in the in the trenches of the pandemic. You know, I mean, cases go up, cases go down. It, it's not going away. And I think people are gradually becoming more comfortable with going to the movies who were hesitant before. But in the meantime. You know, one by one, a lot of them are closing. Um, and the ones that are able to roll with it, the ones that happen to have supportive customers or live in a, or, excuse me, are in a good marketplace, um, who maybe get some lucky breaks. And, and a lot of us got uh, federal grant money, federal relief during the pandemic to help us get through that. I mean, they're going to, you know, to quote Ninochka, there's going to be fewer but better theaters, right? To paraphrase Ninochka. Um, so I think that. They're not going to disappear, but I think they're going to end up being more like museums. You know, every town has a museum where you can see art that you can't see elsewhere. And I think that, or every big city, I should say, and I think that <laughs> marketplaces will still support that, but not every marketplace is going to be able to support it. And, and it's not, a lot of them are not going to be for profit. Um you know, it, it's 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 it was already a nickel and dime business, and now it's a penny business. Yeah, and think, another John? thing. Uh, well, I'll just add to that. I think I think you're absolutely right, Ian. But I also I also believe that the more creative theaters can be, especially those that are working with film festivals. I think film festivals have proven if you can do unique events, you have receptions afterwards, you have Q and A's, you create more of an experience for the community. And for a lot of a lot of festivals and community theaters that have loyal followings they do really well you know i used to do naples and they had a multiplex you know in the middle of a, a mall that did really really well uh they packed almost every screening uh it's harder to do on hollywood boulevard because there's so many other distractions but i think i think they're not going anywhere i just think it's going to take creativity but you know you, you guys you guys can do it it's just a question of how how can you be unique and the other thing is you know, a lot of the bigger theater chains, I don't know what you guys do, Ian, but they started getting creative during the pandemic when things were kind of slowing down and, and started renting out their theaters for parties and whatnot. So, for example, for 500 bucks or a thousand bucks, you could rent a theater for a birthday party, and bring in, you know, 20 kids and and watch a movie. So there's there's creative ways to do it. I just think that the the paradigm to, to use an overused word is is shifting and i don't think the old model is going to work i think it's going to take more creativity creativity to to make it last yeah, and i think kind of hearkening back to how garen started talking about the, the spanish flu pandemic of 100 years ago i mean i don't know that the changes in this industry are going to necessarily be the same as it was then but it does create change right i mean it does create lasting change and so that spawned Hollywood and spawned the movie palace being bigger and bigger and airier and nicer and cleaner. And so I don't, you know, whatever is coming is going to be different than what was. It's going to still be the same idea, but it's going to be different. It has to be. Yeah. And then the other thing I did, I did, a, I did a, this, this, this webinar the other day and you could just throw another interesting kind of stat to chew on. Um, you, you could see the charts growing each year not just because of the pandemic, but before the pandemic growing each year. So the theatrical was shrinking and the digital was growing. And, and I think that for the bigger chains, certainly the event pictures and the, and the, and the movies that get a hundred million dollar marketing campaign are going to still drive cheeks to seats for the repertory theater though. 
unfortunately, it's going to be a bit more of a struggle, right? Because some of those people that got stuck at home during the pandemic kind of realize, you know what, this is kind of like this, <laughs> kind of <laughs> do this on my couch. And there's a lot of options. And, you know, if I wait two weeks to see, you know, Marcel, the, the, you know, or everything everywhere, if I wait just a little bit longer. I can just see it at home and I can save money. So it's not going to go anywhere, but I do think that it's going to be a challenge. And I think the biggest challenge too is going to be how, how do the youngest generations end up? How does it play out for them? Because the way they look at entertainment is so different than than my generation or your generation, maybe. And like that, that remains to be seen because they're a big driver of the box office. I mean, Marvel is a perfect example of that. Um, then they remain that maybe not certainly not for art house movies, but they're not going to repertory cinema. I can tell you that. No, but I, mean, I have a I have a 15, a 14 year old son who wants to see all the Marvel movies in the theater. Yeah. Right. But he'll watch the Umbrella Academy at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Well, we have we have to wrap up. And I, I will add one little bit before I let you guys shamelessly pimp yourselves. Um, and, and that is, I think, I think what's going to change, and I think Ian is doing this, and John, I think you alluded to it with the event, but I think it's going to have to be more experiential. I think you have to create a community, and it has to be an experiential uh, uh, event for people to get off their couches and enjoy it. And it's finding that sweet spot where you get the different demographics to come in. And I think film festivals are a great lead for that. But, John, please tell the folks who are listening and watching this uh, what's going on in your universe and why they should be following you. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, well, I think the most important thing for us is, is iGems.tv. Uh, it just launched their, their mobile app. And this is an opportunity for audiences, you know, and quality movies, right? This is not for the masses. We're not talking about the little tiny projects that, you know, are kind of B or C pictures. We're talking about quality entertainment and that's independent art house movies out of can and Sundance and everything else. I, iGems.tv has a, a weekly newsletter. We've got a mobile app now. And then on iGems Pro, we have a ton of resources for independent filmmakers where they can learn more about what's happening in the independent film space, take courses like film festival mastery, and uh, distribution revolution and, and really just a, a tool that can help them advance their careers. So that's the, that's the best place to go. Sounds cool, man. And, and Ian, what's going down at the Somerville? Well, we are currently riding the Jordan Peele Nope train, which is great. Nice little uh, <laughs> midsummer boost. That's but, a fun film. I enjoyed uh, that. The audience is, it's, it's a little, it's funny. I mean, there's a little bit of a love it or hate it uh, quotient to it, but it's like 80% love it, 20% hate it. Um, but it's doing business, which is all I really care about. <laughs> but uh, I mean, we're we're continuing to roll. We have uh, repertory calendars that come out every two months. Um, we've got live events. We've got film festivals such as the Sci-Fi Film Festival, the Independent Film Festival of Boston in April, and live events too. So we, we you know, we're just it for us. It's a slow roll. It's just building it, you know, event by event to a large degree, and um, it, it's like whack a mole, you know. Sometimes you get a big Hollywood movie and that's paying your bills. Sometimes you get an event that's paying your bills. Really good months, you get a bunch of both, you know. So it's just uh, week by week. But hey, like I said, we've been there for over 100 years and we are doing everything in our power to be there for another 100. Yeah. Well, let me let me ask you a question, Ian. So if we brought you Filmocracy and I are teaming up on some some screenings and premieres for filmmakers, if we brought you a movie with with a little marketing support, would you do event event premieres at your venue? Yeah, we do that type of stuff all the time. So, I mean, awesome. not, not, yeah, we haven't done it with a company like that per se, but we're absolutely glad to consider everything. I mean, especially if there's marketing behind it. There's plenty of people who, you know, want to rent the theater and I have to give them the life is not a Mickey Rooney movie speech <laughs> where the whole the whole town is not going to show up here, you know, just because you made it. Um, so people who have marketing, it really helps. And sometimes they surprise you. They do really well. And, and filmocracy, by the way, I love. We're doing uh, we're doing our virtual stuff with them, and we've got some events. Oh, wonderful! Well. Uh, Philip is a great That's guy. Great to hear. Um, anyways, we're going to close out with another clip. Uh, I really want to thank you guys, and for everyone else, we're going to go to www.bostonsci-fi.com, buy tickets, buy sheet T-shirts, do all that kind of stuff. But this conversation reminded me of my uh, uh, incipient days when I was at the Orson Welles Cinema. 
and we got to see great Truffaut films. So I wanted to close out with a nice long segment of Francois Truffaut's Day for Night. And here is that clip. And thank you all, and have a good night. Yeah, you too. Thanks, guys. Nice to meet you. Thank you.